Okay, I was going to give the Jeff disclaimer, so that <laughs> <laughs> whatever he says, we don't support him. But um, Jeff has been such an active member and <coughs> member of every nature organization in Kansas. Um, Kansas um, Native Plant Society, uh, Topeka Audubon, Audubon of Kansas. Um, Kansas Children's Discovery Center, you name it, Jeff is part of it. And he always brings us lively, entertaining uh, <laughs> events. And this is probably the record number of people we've had in here. So I don't know how he paid all of you to be here, <laughs> but he really wanted to have the highest number of people ever. So I think he did it. So, um, it only cost me like $2,000. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was probably worth it. But if you ever have a chance to go to anything, that Jeff speaks at or he, he does nature walks around Topeka they're always delightful so. okay shut up uh, okay just <laughs> this is my first time public speaking. um we'll just get started but um, okay because that and we probably don't, I don't need to talk about um because we won't have enough time. Um, creating a bird, bird friendly habitat. We start out with a predator bird. Most people say, well, that's not very bird friendly. It's gonna come and eat my birds. Well, that's part of a bird friendly habitat. You're, you're creating this great habitat that's bringing lots of things in. It's gonna bring the predator birds in too, but there's things you can do to help, help everything. Um, any smarty pants that know what kind of bird that is? Terry, you can't say. <laughs> It's a hawk. We know it's a hawk. Is it a cooper? Cooper. Um, because it's in it's in the wood it's in the woods. It's in trees in a backyard. More than likely, it's going to be either a cooper's hawk or a sharp shinned hawk. And you can't see where its eyes are in its head because it's looking straight at you. Probably the best thing to look at is its feet. The feet. I know it's hard to compare. What it, uh, sharp shin would have dainty little feet. That's got pretty big thick feet. So Cooper's hawk. And also I'd say the, the spotting on the breast might be a giveaway too because sharp shins, the young ones out are more spotted, like splotchy. But anyway, uh, Cooper's hawk. Um, first slide, no picture. Just, to, um, just talking about all our backyards, that, that's a huge chunk of land. So what we do in our own yards, our own land that we own, has a huge effect on birds and all wildlife. And, I mean, and we, we have the choice of what we can plant, what we can do there. Um, and I say the plants we use in our properties has a profound effect on the birds. The reason I say that is everything starts with the plants. All life starts with plants. Everything, all your insects live on the plants. Then all your things like spiders and birds, they eat those insects. If you don't have the right plants, you don't have all that. And then birds, if you don't have insects, you're not gonna have birds. All our, all our um, backyard birds, pretty much all of them, they need insects. And especially when they're raising their young. And if you don't have baby birds, you don't have adult birds. So, and then the third point, which is very sad but true, most plants that people have in their landscapes are not native plants. They're not from this region. Most of them are from Asia or Europe. And it's what's been pushed on us. It's been what, what's been told that we, we should buy these plants that no, no bugs will ever eat. Well, then you're, you're basically creating a desert when you're planting these plants that are not from our area, our region. And so, ba and basically, as a planting alien species of plants has a negative impact on birds. And so, basically, alien versus native. If it's a native plant, it originated in a place. So, all plants are native. Um, the Bradford pear, yeah, I could say it's a native plant, but it's not native to the U.S. or North America. It's native to Asia. So, it's where the plants originated. So, um, so. Basic, the basic things that birds need for survival, these are kind of given. They need food, just like people. They need water. Shelter, big deal. I mean, think of the, some of the weather we get if they don't have shelter. And shelter also is big to protect them from predators. So 
and then nesting sites and that goes back to if they don't if birds can't nest and raise young we don't have more birds I mean their numbers will plummet and we all probably know what that bird is a little Carolina wren. What do you think he's eating there? Peanuts. Peanuts. Insects. Peanuts. Insects. <laughs> he's, he's actually coming there probably for those peanuts because I, I remember watching him. He would actually like jackhammer them and break them into smaller pieces. Are but those native peanuts? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really, I actually do not know where the peanut or originates. Do you know Miss Horticulture? South I think America. it might be it originates Georgia. in North America. Georgia. Yeah. Georgia. Yeah. I think, but I mean, I think, I don't know if the Native Americans cultivated it early on. Africa. Yeah. Yeah. Africa? Yeah. Okay, that's true. <laughs> that <period. laughs> Sorry. But where do peanuts come from? They come from plants. It still goes back to all the food originates with plants. So food, and there I just said it, all food originates with plants. Whether, whether a bird is eating an insect or they're eating seeds or, or other parts of plants, it still all originates with the plants. And I'm going to keep saying that over and over because I think no, a lot of people have never realized how important plants are in the environment to everything above it. So some foods directly from plants, like all the little seeds they're eating. <coughs> And then animals that eat plants. A lot of people, they read that and they, well, animals that eat plants, uh, rabbits, deer, no, insects. Insects are the animals, are the biggies that eat plants. And then, even though I talk about plants and how important they are and, and, and all that food, we still can offer supplemental food. And that's probably one of the most fun things to do is offer bird seed to see what birds you can attract. And plus, you can get them to come in fairly close and get pictures. Like those, those are like this far from my back window. I set up this table right outside this back window. And you guys know what those birds are? Tree sparrows. Tree sparrows, which are typically not normal, I mean, common backyard birds. But this was a couple of years ago when we had a really bad drought and there just was no wild food for things. And I had 50 of them living in my backyard all winter long. And so, and whoops. And the big identifying thing on a, of a tree sparrow is the little spot on his breast, which you can see on two of the back ones. And they have the little wing bar and whatnot. Jeff, is it, do you, can we ask a question now or should we wait? Uh, we should all ask questions. Yeah. Yeah. You can ask a question if, you know, we'll keep it short. It's a yes or no. <laughs> yeah. Um, is it true that if you feed the birds during the winter, you should also continue to feed during the summer? I don't have a good answer. I, I personally, I don't think it makes a huge difference. I think, I mean, these birds are finding food in the wild generally. Um, I think it's more, I mean, it's a good thing. If you, if you want to keep seeing the birds, it's good if you continually feed them. But for the longest time, I only fed in the winter. I never bothered with summer feeding. I think the most important times to feed, though, are late winter and early spring, because they've exhausted all their wild food, and that's when you're really going to start seeing things. Plus, you'll, start getting, you'll get migratory birds, so they're coming through in the spring. If you're feeding, like in May, even like May, I've seen a lot of neat birds because I've been stocking my bird feeders. So I'd, I'd say feed all year, but I also find once it gets to be 90 degrees out, I quit filling my feeders. I just, the, I just don't care. There's <laughs> lots of bugs then. And too. there's, yeah, and you go out and you get, yeah, there, there's a plenty of other food and you just, you, you'll get some neat things, but it's, to me, late winter and spring are really important. So, <laughs> um, back to plants. <laughs> plants are at the bottom of the food chain. Literally everything, pretty much everything, starts with plants. There's, there's exceptions. But, um, and what I think is getting you, birds, they eat the seeds. I mean, that's kind of a given, because we put bird seed out for them. But they eat fruit. I mean, that's, what, that's really why a lot, like, why plants produce, like, berries and stuff. It's not just for fun. It's to get birds to come eat the berries, move the seeds somewhere so they, so they can grow another plant. They'll eat the foliage. It's probably not a big thing. I think Gary even 
kind of hammered that to us in his presentation that most most foliage birds can't digest, but they especially like the buds. A lot of times in the spring, you'll see birds eating the buds on trees and stuff. So the real tender new growth they like. And the nectar from plants, the only thing I know that eats nectar from plants are hummingbirds. Maybe some of our other birds do, I don't know. So that's not a real biggie, but it's something. The biggie though, I think, is that the plants supporting our, our native insects that, that um, the birds then eat. And not just the birds eat, like I said, spiders eat them. Different things eat those insects than the birds may eat them. Other things eat them. And which I say in the, in the next, next bullet. Um, and this is actually a statistical fact that invertebrates are the main food source for birds, especially nesting birds. So 96%, it's like your, your, your birds that live in backyards and stuff live off insects. And what do insects have? They have lots of protein and I think fats. They've got all kinds of goodies in them. And if, you, if you've seen a fast little, what are, what, are, what are birds that have nestlings that, is it, it's not precocious, it's, Altruism. what's the word? Altruism. Whatever he said, I can't say it. <laughs> you know, the ugly baby naked birds. Yeah. They're hatched yeah, and they, I think a lot of them double in size every day. I know my flickers when they nested, they literally, the babies doubled in size every day just from eating insects. Imagine if we doubled in size every day when we were born. <laughs> I mean, it's really, it's really quite amazing. So they go from this ugly naked bird, you know, featherless little clump of ugliness <laughs> to like a full grown bird in like two weeks. I mean, it really is, it's pretty amazing. So, sorry about all these words. I thought I had more pictures. They're coming. <laughs> I keep talking about plants and the whole native versus alien thing. Native plants originate here, alien plants originate somewhere else. <clears throat> and, the, and the native plants support thousands of kinds of insects. It's so true, it's so, so true. Like, I'll get, uh, get to another slide, but um, to give you numbers. Um, more insects mean more, more birds. And so now you, you go to a landscape where all the plants are from Asia and there's so few insects there, and then there's so few birds. I mean, it's just, it's a fact of life. And I know for a fact that all the birds in my neighborhood come to my yard to eat, because I cannot grow butterflies or any kinds of insects, because the birds are eating everything. So sometimes I say, I hate birds, because they eat all my, all my cool insects. So anyway, so here's some numbers. And this is just, <coughs> of all the different kinds of insects, this is just butterflies and moths. And so it's got a group of plants like the oaks. They support 534 species of insects. Mm -hmm. And th these numbers are from the Doug Talame uh, Bringing Nature Home book. I don't know how they got this information. Someone did some major studies. Willows, 456. I mean, look at those numbers. So these are all, and, and these are all native oaks, native willows. Mm -hmm. Then you jump over here, and, and these are some really common landscape trees that, were, that are pushed upon us to plant. The calorie pear, which is Bradford pear, they're everywhere. They're also becoming invasive, zero. And if you ever, if you look at some of these plants, if you look at a Bradford pear and you look at the leaves in the fall, there's no insect damage on them. They're, they look like they're plastic. And I mean, that, that's how they look. And a lot of these things are like that. They just have like plastic leaves because nothing eats, on, eats them. And you know, I have zeros after them all. There might be some introduced insect that's on them. Introduced it. But they're, often it's an introduced insect. What's the tree of heaven I don't have on here? But tree of heaven is an introduced Asian <coughs> plant, but there's a moth that's now in North America that lives <coughs> on tree of heaven. Hello, so. Huh? How about red cedar? Red cedar is actually native, but I, only, I, don't, I don't think a lot of insects are on it. There's some... There, there's some little butterfly that... The I want to call it the red streak. cedar elfin, but that's not... Yeah, juniper juniper elfin? Hair streak. Yeah, juniper hair streak. Some of these people should be doing this talk. The juniper <laughs> hair streak, streak is on the cedar tree. But, and cedars have their benefits. I'll say, yeah. don't, don't the birds... My birds are in my cedars. Yeah, but cedars are native, actually. Yeah. But actually, fruit trees, birds will eat fruit. They don't care where the fruit's come from. They don't care that the fruit's from Asia or North America. They'll eat that, and that's why a lot of these have become horrible invasive plants, because the birds eat the fruit. The, the Amir honeysuckle, second to the last, 
that's this bush honeysuckle that's taken over all our yeah. woodlands now. Yeah. Well, when that happens, all the birds that used to be like ground nesting and lived on the forest floor, they can't live there now, so they're gone. So, depressing but true. Ah, a picture. <laughs> so, natural food that birds that birds might eat. We talked about seeds. Don't eat that. Berries, foliage, flowers, nectar, and then a caterpillar. I don't know how often birds eat the black swallowtail. This is a black swallowtail caterpillar. It's brightly colored, and that's supposed to be a warning to birds. But even if the bird doesn't eat it, because I know they don't all survive, there's insects also that will eat these, and then the birds eat the insects. So. So there we list a bunch of invertebrates, the butterflies. And that's a butterfly right there. It's a caterpillar, but it's still a butterfly. It's a, it's a stage of the life of a butterfly. Who knows what that caterpillar will become? Because I don't remember. <laughs> it's on a senna. Yeah, it's on a senna. Very good, Mickey. Yeah. <laughs> he recognized the leaf. And is there an egg up there at the top? Yeah, see that little yellow protrusion off the leaf? That's the egg of one of these butterflies. It's either a clouded or a cloudless sulfur, I believe, is what that caterpillar is. I only think I only saw one of these caterpillars once in my yard because the birds eat them. The birds eat all my insects and all my butterflies. And if you think about it, one butterfly may lay a thousand eggs. Maybe only a few of those eggs actually make it to adulthood because the rest become food. Huh? Your neighbors have more native food. Yeah, and if all of you guys have more native stuff in your yard, it will have an effect on the bird life. And so, you know, I just listed off a bunch of insects, but then spiders, spiders are not insects, and spiders do not eat plants. I don't, there's no spiders that eat plants. They all are carnivores. They eat other animals. Snails, what do snails eat? Plants? Plants. Debris. And aren't they detri detritivores? Mm -hmm. Who knows what a detritivore is? Dead. They eat dead plants, basically, or dead things. And there's a lot of insects and there's actually some butterfly species, they don't eat the green plants, they eat the dead plants, the leaf litter. So it's important to leave leaf litter in your garden, or your yard. Next. <laughs> Seeds. So here, so I just listed off, these are all mostly the top ones that are annual plants. Annual plants produce way more seeds than perennial plants because annual plants, they grow one year and die. So they've got to produce lots of seeds for their next generation. So because they produce lots of seeds, they produce lots of food for things. Annual grasses, annual sunflowers. So we all feed sunflower seeds in our garden, mm -hmm. or in our yards. That's the wild sunflower. That's, that's the parent plant, basically, to the uh, sunflowers that we feed, and it's just been bred up and to larger seeds. Ragweeds are really good. A lot of people hate the ragweed. It's not a pretty plant, really, now showy flowers really high in protein. Birds love ragweed seeds. Smart weeds, which are the um, polygonums. Is that right, Gary? Uh, pig weeds, which are amaranth. If you've ever heard of amaranth, the grain, that's a pig weed. Lamb's quarter is the uh, quinopodium. Um, the, big seed, the big thing people eat, quinoa, that's a lamb's quarter. It's a quinopodium. And then I, then I threw in oaks and hickories, which here in Kansas, our woodlands are oak hickory woods, and the oak, the, the seeds of those, probably little birds don't eat them so much, but they're a, they're a big food source, and I'm sure wild turkeys, turkeys gobble really them down. Crackles, yeah. Berries, hackberries. Hackberry is a very common tree. Black cherry, I'd say it's fairly common. Choke cherry, wahoo, raspberries, blackberries, gooseberries, strawberries. Some of those are trees, some are shrubs, some are canes, and some are <laughs> just uh, herbaceous plants, the strawberry. All, bird, you know, birds love fruits. Foliage, eh, not such a big thing, but the buds of plants, leaves, somewhat. Foliage is probably not a biggie, but somewhat. I mean, the ca Canada geese love um, grass. They're eating, you know, plants, the leaves. Um, flowers. You wouldn't think flowers, that birds eat flowers, but I've seen birds sitting on the flowers and pulling the petals off and eating them. So that's another thing they'll eat. And if you think about it, like the petals on a flower, 
they're pretty tender. They're not, you know, high, real fibrous and rough. So you can imagine birds eating them, and I suppose they're pretty nutritious too. And while they're doing that, they're also, you've got a blooming flower. What comes to blooming flowers probably? Maybe pollinating insects. So you'll, where there's flowers blooming, there's little insects. And some of our native little bees, they're so little, you can barely see them. And the birds will pick them off and eat them too. So, nectar, cardinal flower, hummingbirds love it. And yeah, I know that much else does, milkweeds. Mm -hmm. Those are just some birds that hummingbirds, some flowers hummingbirds might go to, but not a huge food thing. And actually, go back to this, cardinal flower, it's a native flower. It's one of the few red flowers we have that's native here in Kansas. And the whole reason that is, insects don't see red. Insects see yellows and, and whites and, and violets. So that's what most, the color of most of our flowers are, because that's what insects see. That's why you don't see a whole lot of red flowers. Go to the tropics and you see a lot more red flowers because you have other kinds of pollinators in the tropics. So now we're going to talk about food that we supply to the birds. And again, um, if I didn't, I mean, yeah, I talk about all the wild things that you should have in your garden that help the birds and stuff. But when it comes to really wanting to see the birds and bring them in close, feed the birds, feed the birds. And I always say, we don't, I don't think, I suppose some of us feel good about, oh, we're helping the birds, but really I think we're being selfish and we want to see the birds. And so we feed them so we get to see them. Um, number one, suet. Um, suet's basically animal fat. I should just say animal fat instead of suet because technically suet's a special fat around the kidneys on an animal and really any kind of fat from animals. You think, why do birds want to eat fat? I mean, that doesn't even seem like a natural thing. Well, when they're eating insects, they're getting all kinds of fats. So, and in the wintertime, there's not a whole lot of insects to find. Suet's like a really good, high energy food for them. Um, I don't think most people talk about table scraps being something you want to feed to birds, but it's like one of my, it's, I don't know if there's 10 things up there, my top 10 list of things to feed birds. <coughs> Um, Janine and I were out, um, were we drinking the other night? No. No, we weren't. I, I got some, some chicken wings, and so I had all the leftover chicken wings, and I was like, I want to take these home, and she tells the waitress, he wants to feed them to the birds. <laughs> and I do, I take the, so the, the bits and pieces of the chicken, put it out in the morning, and the crows love it. It's a great thing to feed to crows. Uh, sunflower seeds, cracked corn, millet, peanuts, it doesn't mealworms. Bring rats in. Huh? It doesn't bring rats in? I put it out in the morning. Well, I don't think rats like chicken anyway. Put it out in the morning, it's gone. It's gone by noon. Uh, mealworms, I feed that some. It gets to be an expensive thing to feed the birds. Um, sugar water for the hummers and orioles maybe. And fresh fruit and jelly for some birds and orioles. If you're um, going to do the fresh fruit, say oranges that are just, you know, got a little soft, mm -hmm. should you cut them open? You usually you cut them in half, and then you like, I I have a I don't have a picture of the orange, but I've got I'll show you the feeder that you can feed them on. But you just have a stick in the ground and put it on it so it's facing up, and like especially in the spring, and I think it's because the orioles come from the tropics where they're used to eating fruit. In the very spring, they'll eat oranges. So. And then when they eat the orange out, then I fill it with grape jelly. In the top oh. of the orange. She so. should be doing this talk. No, I should not. Yeah, you should. <laughs> and who knows what that bird is? Red belly woodpecker, male or female. Mm -hmm. So you guys know your stuff. Yeah, so because the red only comes up the back of the head and then it's gray, that's the female red belly woodpecker. What kind of feeder is it on? Wow. Yeah, to me that's the best feeder a platform feeder it's just square it's got wire underneath it you put the seed out there the birds can see it flying over a bunch of them can feed on it at once and all, birds that like to be on the ground or clinging to things all kinds of birds will come to eat in that but don't you get raccoons no because if you got if raccoons or squirrels are a problem you get a predator guard you get a guard yeah. you get a heavy-duty oh. feeder you don't get a flimsy one 
and you get a, a, a garden. I don't think I have a picture of one, but yeah. And they work. And they really yeah. do work. Yeah. Although squirrels are really good at figuring out ways yeah. to get to feeders. Yeah. And yeah. so, but mealworms have to be alive or? I buy the freeze-dried ones. Okay. They like the live ones, but they cost like a dollar a mealworm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's an exaggeration, but you could spend a thousand dollars on mealworms in a year. Okay, so either one is fine. Suet, and those are all the birds that like suet. And notice the last bird I drew a line through. Why did I draw, draw a line through the starling? Well, some people I don't think know this. Starlings, A, they're not native. And so what that they're not native? That's not necessarily the problem. The problem is they compete so much with our native birds, driving them away, destroying their nesting sites. They do so much damage. So I don't want to really encourage the starlings, but they love suet. Huh? <laughs> I know I do that, which I, that, they'll be. An, I'm going to do a presentation sometime on controlling starlings and sparrows, because it's actually what I have found is a lot of people don't know what to do about them, and there's actually lots of options, but no one ever wants to talk about it, because uh, because anyway, and and that bird is a flicker, a northern flicker, and is it a male or female? Male, male, because it's got the mustache. And is it a, it's got a black mustache, so it's a yellow shafted. If it had a red mustache, it'd be a red shafted, which is the more Western, Western United States. There's two, I don't know if they're considered subspecies or forms or whatever. In the ver Western U.S., like what, the Rockies West, is the red shafted. And then the Eastern U.S. has the yellow shafted, but we live in Kansas where they integrate. And so you could have, you could have a, well, red and yellow is orange, so it'd be an orange shafted. <laughs> They're not called orange shafted flickers, but they should be. <laughs> but I had one once. I saw. I, I never really looked at them. It's like, hey, that flicker's got a red mustache, and it was a red shafted flicker. So, um, whoopsie. Table scraps, and so my examples of table scraps: any kind of cooked meat, like chicken again. You cook, like if I cook a whole chicken and I eat all the meat and have all the gunk left over, I go put out the crows, the crows are the, they, they love it. But you don't put it out at night because then you'll get raccoons. You put it out in the morning and once the crows start coming, it'll be gone. You know, I only put out like a little handful, but every day, and my crows now are coming and they come and it's, it's, it's so fun to watch them because of their antics. And then like the hawks come and the crows chase the hawks and it's, it's quite interesting. Um, so cooked chicken script, cooked eggs is really a good one. And even if you just wanted to take an egg and cook it and then crumble <coughs> it up and throw it outside, a lot of birds like that. I know like the Carolina wrens and they need that protein. There's all that the protein in it. Too. Huh? Like the shell. Yeah. Oh, and the shells too. What kind of plant is that? Just you're getting ahead of the talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> Actually, I'm not sure what it is. Now I'll get to it. Uh, cooked eggs. Breads are really a biggie. So I was just out to steak night last night, and I had all my friends give me all their uh, bread from our meal, and I took it home to the crows and gave it to them this morning. Can we come over to your house and eat? <laughs> you sure can. Um, get all those things. <laughs> and then pancakes. When I say pancakes, I have my own recipe for pancakes, but like one egg, some flour, water, baking yeah. soda, and then cook it in a whole bunch of grease, a lot of oil. <laughs> and that, that's so good for the crows and blue jays in the wintertime because they need all that fat. <coughs> so the, those pancakes absorb all that fat, and so it's really good for the birds, and plus they really like it. And you can crush the eggshells in it too. They're good for you. And they're good. For, and sometimes when I make like pancakes or waffles, there's one left over. I take that out to them too. Um, crows and blue jays love them, but unfortunately, starlings love all that stuff too. Bad, bad birds. So that tree there is the infamous. So I don't know if this has a pointer on it, um, but see these little things here? Those are catkins, which are the little flowers of the plant. That is hop horn beam in early spring. Oh. Hop horn beam or ironwood. And so they get those catkins in the spring. And anyway, that's a hop horn beam. And that's a blue jay. Is that a male blue jay or a female blue jay? You cannot tell. It's a blue you cannot blue jay. tell. Anyway, I don't think you can. No, you cannot. They can. They can. They can. <laughs> going to just leave. <laughs> um, sunflower seeds. I'd have to say if you're going to feed anything, feed sunflower seeds. 
You spray the most kinds of birds like sunflower seeds. Almost everything will eat sunflower seeds. And I mean, crows probably will. I don't think I ever see them in my sunflower seed feeder because I'm feeding them all that good stuff. But um, pretty much everything likes sunflowers. Chickadees, tip mice, blah, 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 blah. Squirrels. Squirrels love <laughs> Raccoons love them. Turkeys. Um, again, I've got a platform feeder. And then that's a bird I hardly ever see. And that is a... It's a gross beak. I believe it's the red... Rose, I mean the rose breasted. Sorry, I'm new to birds, so <laughs> I'm just learning. So it's a rose breasted gross beak, but I know I had a black headed gross beak once, but they look similar. But I think that it was a female, I think that had stripes on the breast or something. But that's the red rose breasted gross beak. You don't, you're not going to see these in the winter time. So this is a great reason to be feeding in spring and summer to get that bird because they're gorgeous. That's, that's a male, the female doesn't look anything like that. They're brown and they almost look like a female red winged blackbird, mm -hmm. I mean, roughly. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I probably don't see those even every year. I've, I've only seen them a couple times. Really nice birds. And mm. what's those yellow flowers in the back? Blurry. <laughs> I have no idea what they are. <laughs> no, because I don't have my yarrow's white. Golden Alexander? It's not Golden Alexander. And we know this is spring. I think that's um, Culver's root, the blurry stuff on the right. I don't know what the... Oh, they're black-eyed Susans. That's what they are. Spring plant. They're very blurry. Yeah, that's what they are. Okay, maybe they're not. I'd have to say that these are my favorite backyard birds or crows. I mean, most people think, crows, really? But they're so interesting and they're so smart. And mine, this year they haven't, but one year they would come up to my back door and put their eye up to the window and look in <laughs> and see, when are you bringing out the food? I mean, that's what I'm assuming. Most of them, are, they're, usually, they're, they're so smart and they're very skittish. They're not just going to come in. I mean, the second I go out, they usually fly away because people shoot them and, and they're leery of people. But if you get to feeding them and feed them every day and they start coming every day, it's, it's just interesting having them. One year I had one that was completely missing its entire bill. And I figured someone shot it, shot at it and hit its bill. And, but it was still able to eat the corn off the ground and stuff. It was still able to eat. But um, crack corn lists all these. You'll note a lot of native sparrows are listed up there. N crack corn and millet are the things I feed to the sparrows. And uh, anyway, so that's cracked corn. I buy my cracked corn at the bird place here in town because they actually sell non-GMO corn. So it's, it, depending what you believe, but the GMO <laughs> corn has genetics of, is it an insect? Or anyways, in the actual corn, so if you eat it, who knows what it's doing to it your system? Bacillus thergenesis. It's got the bacillus in it that kills all insects that eat the corn. So then the birds eat it too, and who knows? And we eat it. Who knows what effect it has on us? Anyway, you can get non-GMO corn there. Who knows what that bird is? That's a little song sparrow. I haven't had one of those in my yard for years, but I usually only get them when it snows, and it doesn't snow anymore. So, but um. That's what I always say. They always have the like a raccoon mask. Whether it's the female or the male, they have that mask. And then the goldfinch on the other side. Um, I put sunflower seeds in my two feeders. A lot of people buy the <coughs> niger, this, thistle. niger thistle. I don't even buy that stuff. It seems like I buy it and it goes bad. And all birds like sunflower seeds, so just buy sunflower seeds. A lot more affordable too. But that's just, that's my opinion. Do what works for you. Ugh. Sue. I mean, suet. You put out suet in a, in a cage and what shows up? Starlings. And then once they find out about it, they bring all their friends too. Um, I used to always feed suet in the, the little wire cage things. And then I discovered to take a log, drill holes in it, and stuff suet in the log. And I, I don't, I, I'm gonna throw away my wire cages because the birds that come are the birds that naturally like to cling to trees to feed. And so now I have brown creepers that come every day and feed at my log feeder. And it's so cool to see them. And the starlings still come. And, but they, the starlings have more trouble hanging onto the log to feed. They still can do it, but they're, 
they're not as good at it. And then the woodpeckers like it, and the nut hatches, and the tip mice. And, um, and I started making my own suet because of someone here in the audience told, gave me this recipe. And now I swear by it. The birds love the homemade suet way better than the store-bought stuff. And one reason I think is you're feeding them. It's basically, I'll just throw out the recipe real quick. It's the fat, it's cornmeal, oatmeal, and flour. Peanut butter. And peanut butter, thank you. And the peanut butter is the butter. secret ingredient, I think, because the birds smell it. Mm. You don't put any seeds in it. Because really the birds that are eating suet, they don't want those seeds, but the stuff you buy, they put seeds in it as filler, so they don't have to use as much mm -hmm. suet in, in the thing. But I, I mean, the birds just go through it. I, I, I mean, they go through it fast. And, it, and if you do it to save money, it does not save money. It costs more to make your own suet, but the birds really like it more. And feeding the birds is not a cheap hobby. It is actually kind of spendy. <laughs> That's why, actually, when I'm in restaurants, I want to go around and get in the <laughs> to take home to the birds. Just shout out your question. Jeff, don't throw away your, the wire. Give them to you. No. You put things in it for making uh, nests. Oh, you yeah, I've done that. If, if you've got an animal yeah. and it sheds. She should be that. giving this presentation because <laughs> I don't have that in here, but that's a... I'm going to get to nesting stuff. And but the nesting stuff, that. that works perfectly for nesting. That's true. That's true. Thank you. Um, you know, people have asked me, like, my homemade suet. I like now I render my own fat, which basically you put it in the oven and let, at, at a low temp, and you get just the fat out of the tissue. Um, but then you're mixing it with all those other things that you're not really serving pure um, fat. And I think it's good in the summer too, because the birds are gonna eat it so fast, it's not gonna have time to go bad, I don't think. But I'll also say I mostly feed it in the winter. So we'll see what I do this summer. I tend to stop suet in the summer anyway because they're they going for insects. They yeah, the suet's really kind of to replace the bugs that no they would normally get in the summer. So. Does anyone know if those are male or female starlings? And there is a way to tell. Yeah. I think, I think they're males. Why? Because they're speckled. No, they're all speckled in the winter. The base of the bill on the males is supposed to be kind of a bluish gray. And on the females, it's supposed to be more of a pinkish. Although, personally, I can't really tell a lot. I mean, sometimes you can really tell. The males are more brightly colored too, and I think those are looking kind of bright, but maybe it's just because they're in the sun. And if on the males are so much more aggressive than the females, so they're probably at the feeders because they'll chase everything away, including yeah. the female. Yeah. They are the most aggressive birds I think I've ever seen. And oh, I'm gonna do my impression of a, a starling coming to feed its babies. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they sound like. They're the most horrible sounding <laughs> bird, in my opinion. And there's a neat YouTube video of a talking starling. And if you ever have time, go 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 YouTube the talking starling video. This bird has this accent where it sounds like it's the devil, and it's like, it's talking with this weird voice, and it's really scary. I think. <laughs> so if you ever want to scare someone, watch the talking starling video. If I remember, I'll, I'll find it and send it to the, the email list of the Anyway, peanut nut feeders. Um, I mostly put sunflower seeds in mine. But you can put, put peanuts in them too, or nuts. That's a little uh, downy woodpecker, the smaller the cousin of the hairy. We can get the girdle. And that's a girl? Well, there's no red that we there's can no see. There's no red that we can see. It's probably the, it's a girl down. And they know. <laughs> I'm getting the punchline down. <laughs> ah, this is my favorite nectar feeder. It's the suction cup test tube feeder that you can stick to your window. It holds just a little bit of nectar so the nectar won't go bad. And, um, and then the hummingbirds come right up. You can watch them from inside your window. And one year, I loved it, the Oriole came, sat on it. He weighed enough that it would pull it down a little bit so he could get the nectar to come to the end and he put his head down there and suck all the <laughs> And he's this far from me because I'm inside, you know, and I can watch that Oriole. They don't do that. fly I've in never, the window? 
Huh? No, he just came up. He just come up. I had a crow hit my window yeah. once, and that scared the crap out of me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it if they get really close, they don't hit it. It's it's really as good. if they're not close. Yeah. Is that yeah. going to die, Jack? Uh, that I'm, this yeah. Is, I probably was using red dye for uh -oh. a <laughs> It could be reflecting on, maybe I had a red shirt on. Uh, <laughs> 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 it's red dye. <laughs> That's an old picture. But I, I've got four of those now. And I just love them, and 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 so I put them on different sides of the house, and they're like I don't know five or ten bucks. I bought mine at the Wild Bird store here in town. Um, but I love these, and and cleaning them. You know, all, most of those hummingbird feeders they get they're so hard to clean. These are not. You just need a well. They they get the cap sometimes gets a little black. Pipe gunk, you know. Pipe yeah, you get uh, yeah. So uh, I finally bought a pipe cleaner. I gave up pipe smoking, but I bought it. <laughs> anyway. So the next, the next feeder. And now this is a jelly fruit feeder. See the two spikes in the center? You put your ha orange halves on there, and the birds can come up and eat off there. And then the little dish, you throw your jelly in there. And sometimes I get out hungry and I need some jelly on my toast. I go out <laughs> and, <laughs> and I have found: do not cheap out and buy. Dylan's brand cheapo grape jelly. It doesn't smell like grapes. It doesn't taste like grapes. It's corn syrup and food coloring. I think. I I swear by Welch's grape yep. jelly. That's it has. Best. It 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 it, 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 it you open it and you can just smell the grapes and you put it out and the birds come from all over. So there's it's amazing. There's all these little tricks and secrets and that's one of them. Welch's grape jelly. So what's the pole on the right? Oh, this is an interesting thing. So it's just a shepherd's hook, but this is a slinky. I was reading, you want to keep the squirrels off your feeders, you put a slinky on the pole, and the squirrel starts to climb up it, and he goes, woo, woo, and he jumps off. And, and it really works, and then after a while, they get used, they go, woo, woo, and they climb up it. But it, it actually, it has actually worked really pretty well, but there's always one squirrel that figures out how to get around it. So, it's a great use for a slinky, and it's a great conversation. Yeah. Why do you have slinkies on your pole? Jeff, also, another bird that you might not normally see, but here is the catbird. They love the jelly. See, I've never had a catbird come to the jelly that I know of. But, and that's something... Everyone has kind of different experiences too, and you've got different birds, and and so try different things, but don't buy cheap jelly. <laughs> so. Water. So bird baths are obvious. Natural bodies of water are great if you live on a lake, which I do not. But if I did, that'd be wonderful because then I could see. All kinds of cool birds. Um, some people have little creeks going through their, you know, natural creeks. It's a great thing, attracting to birds. But if you don't have those, you can do bird baths. You can do a garden pond. That's that's my little garden pond in the back. Who knows what that blurry bird picture is? It's a warbler, which you're never going to get warblers. Brought. They're not going to come to feeders. Warblers are going to eat insects, but you can get them at your water source. A yellow warbler. And see how he's got white eye rings? Yeah. That's a key to what he is. I'd say he's a Nashville. So that's a, a male Nashville warbler taking a bath in my nice scummy looking pond. But the birds love it, so. Um, drips, like you can just have a, a hose mm -hmm. dripping. Or they make some special drips you can buy, right, for birds and mm -hmm. misters. And then my favorite is the ant mode. Do you guys know what an ant mode is? If you feed hummingbirds and, you, oh, yeah. and ants come to the hummingbird feeder, yeah. you can buy an ant moat, which is like a cup that you fill with water. The ants can't cross the water to get to the feeder. Well, the birds love to drink out of the <laughs> ant moats. Any of your tr like tree, tree loving birds will feed out of ant moats. And I need to replace mine because mine broke. But um, I've got a picture in here. But natural bodies of water, private property, no trespassing, Lake Sherwood, they don't like it trespassing there. But um, bird baths, that's just a dog dish with some rocks in it, which it's a good sized dish, it's a, it's a big dog dish, and so I've got that. Unfortunately, I don't think I've got water in it right now, I need to get, up, get on it. 
We've got two, a pair of bluebirds and a delightful starling there. Um, and adding stones, the birds then can perch on, get on the stones and drink instead of having deep water that they fall in and get wet. And so the, the rocks are really good to help. Does the bluebird have something in its mouth or one of no, I think that's an optical illusion, but it's not it's not like that. it does kind of look like he has something in his beak. Maybe he's just drinking the water. I think it's a. Yeah. I think it's an optical illusion. <laughs> <laughs> and then my little garden pond attracts a wild mallards. Every spring now they come, and it's got to be the same pair. They come. <coughs> They come flying in the yard, and they land, and they're, they're really pretty tame. And they're Do they such, nest around there? I keep want, thinking they will, but I've never known that they have. Jeff, and, um, you should tell people you live in the heart of the city. Oh, oh and, and I live in basically suburbia. <coughs> Suburban Topeka, I'm surrounded by fescue lawns and just, just your generic yards. And I, I mean, I don't, like, Janine lives in like, nature paradise. She has natural woods all around her. I've got natural no woods around me. I mean, maybe a uh, mile away there's some woods. So I've transformed my crappy yard that was just generically a few species, not much native. And I've, I've had it over a hundred species not fly over my yard, but come to my yard to live, wow. eat. Um, <laughs> I need to publish my, my pancake recipe because really, the, like the blue jays and the crows really, really love them. And some of this bird food I make, like the suet, I really want to eat it because it's all food that we eat. It's, it's fat, peanut butter. What do we put in our cookies? Fat, peanut butter, <laughs> sugar, flour, oatmeal. Uh, oatmeal. That's what's in these, the suet that the birds eat. And when you make it and you smell it, it is so good. And Car I, mean, I gotta tell the story. Carolyn had a relative over, and she had made some of the suet, and it was sitting out, and they, they, they looked like these little like bars, and they took what it ate, and did they like it? They were so embarrassed. I don't know. Anyway, I haven't eaten them yet, but next time I make them, I've just gotta try them. It looks like peanut butter fudge. Yeah. Well, we should just go bake some. Maybe we get cookies. Uh, and this is my my poor man's drip I made. I took a hose and I have it dripping into my dog dish and it's sitting on a, a chair. It's horrible. I never. I just took. It. I just did this for the picture to have an example. <laughs> Fill a gallon bucket and put a little hole in the bottom of it and hang it from a shepherd's hook and ah. let it drip into your bird bath. So you've done that? Yeah. Well, there you go. There is an ant moat. So there's an ant moat with some leaves in it and some water. It's obvious I didn't clean it out and put fresh water in it. So who knows what that bird is? It's a nuthatch. That's a red-breasted nuthatch. I have not. And is that a male or a female? I know you. They're they're different. I think that's a female, isn't it? Dark. It's hard to tell because the darker head is a male, but you can't. And it might be an immature too. I don't know. Anyway, that's a red-breasted nuthatch. They only come down some winters. They're eruptive species, so they only come down when their food sources are depleted up north. But those ant moats are the best bird waters. I see more stuff in them than any lake. Mostly chickadees. Chickadees love them. Um, shelter. You gotta have your shelter. That's a that's a shrub. Shrubs are probably the best shelter for. At, at this level, but I say think layers. You want shelter up high with your big trees. You want shelter down low with your shrubs. And then, I, yeah, shrubs and vines. Grasses and forbs, like native grasses that have real thick cover, that's important for a lot of our like, native sparrows. They're not gonna hide out in a tree so much. They might in a bush, but they like to be down low. Different birds like different layers. And then brush piles. I swear by brush piles because you can make a brush pile about this big and so many birds can get in that and hide from, especially from predators. Nest in there, but you'll often find spider webs and I think hummingbirds and spider webs to make their nest with. So you want all these things for them to help them with nesting. And I just got to throw out when the um, great crested flycatcher was nest building, it was the 
it was the coolest thing ever to watch because she did all the work, she would get all the nesting material, and he would follow her and protect her <laughs> while she would nest. And, yeah. then, and, like, and sometimes other birds would come and he'd, he'd attack them, and she's doing all the work. And I, I, I like my grass clippings, I threw them all back in the corner of, the, of my yard. That's where she was, go she'd go back to my grass clip clipping pile, grab a mouthful of grass clippings, he'd follow her back to the nest. And the bluebirds did the same thing. She's building the nest and he's following and watching over. So, and that's something you'll get to see if you make a bird-friendly backyard. Ugh. <laughs> I am almost done. Um, detriments to birds. These invasive, invasive birds. Look, the starling and a house sparrow are fighting for that box. That's what you have to deal with. Pet and feral cats, they eat tons of birds. Insecticides, I don't know how many people think, gotta use insecticides. We're taught we have to kill bugs, bugs are bad. No, we don't have to kill bugs. And you kill the bugs and then you end up killing the birds. And there's other kinds of insect, insecticides that end up killing insects and they get in the food chain. Everything starts down here with the plants and the bugs. And you get that stuff in the food chain and it has a negative effect. Invasive plants, you let these invasive plants take over, they wipe out all the native stuff, there's no insects, there's no life, bad, bad, bad. And then of course, I say the starlings and the house sparrows, because they do their fair share of damage. Um, so, summary, add native trees, add native shrubs, native grasses and wildflowers. That's great, but you gotta remove your alien plants. I, I mean, I, a lot of people say, well, I, I just can't cut that tree down. Just cut it down. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't advocate cutting down all the trees in your yard, but get rid of one of them and replace it with something native. You got a Bradford pear? Get rid of it. Replace it with something. Don't do it all at once, though. Do it piecemeal. I had, I've removed like three or four trees in my yard. You'd never know it. I mean, you replace them. You, you'd be amazed how fast some of these plants will grow. In three or four years, you don't even notice. Call so, the woodworker. The refuge tree. Huh? Call the woodworker. There. The refuge tree. Unfortunately, they probably don't want things like a Bradford bear. They want a black walnut yeah. or something like that that you really don't want to get rid of. Um, supplying water, that really is a, I mean, water really helps. And you know something I did once? I only saw it once. I just turned on my sprinkler, and it's going back and forth, and all these yellow rump warblers come up, and as the sprinkler came this way, they'd flutter in front of it and get a drink. It was so cool to watch. <laughs> of course, I never have been got, gotten them to do it again. Lots of food and feeders. Um, talking about things to do to get ready. Find some books on the subject, you know, is a good thing. There's a, there is a thing online called Yard Map where you can map out your yard and it's a tool that Cornell has. It's free to use. That's something I'd, I'd suggest as a starting place. Google Yard Map and it's got all kinds of good information. It even has information about plants to use and whatnot. Reduce turf areas, that's a really big thing. Start small, you know, pick an area that's 10 by 10 and, and transform it into some native plants. Put in a butterfly garden or something. Um, these are some books I recommend. I don't know if some of them might be back on the table. We do, we have some books. Um, and I, I say use yard map, things I do, I participate in feeder watch. It's a great way to watch the birds in your backyard and learn learn more about them and what they are and how to identify them. Keep a journal. I think one of the greatest things is the first thing, observe all the interactions in your garden. Once you start doing this native plant stuff, it's amazing all these things you'll start to see. I mean, Mickey over there, he took his, his backyard was all alien invasive plants, wasn't it? Except maybe no, it was all. Yeah, it was all. all. <laughs> he had no natives, which is typical of these yards. And he's converted it in what, a year? A year. Yeah. And he's still got a tree I want him to cut down. Which he hasn't <laughs> <been done>. <laughs> <laughs> but he's working on it. But he's ripped out all these uh, alien shrubs around the border, right? I mm -hmm. mean, anyway. And this will be the first year you'll really see what's kind of happening. Um, organizations to be God of Bond, Native Plant Society. If we had time, I was gonna do this playlist of a bunch of bird videos I have, but we don't have time. It's 8.29. But if you go on YouTube, I don't know if there's a good way to find my channel, because I don't have enough subscribers yet to get a URL. Send it out to the 
Audubon group. I could, but it, most of you people aren't on the Audubon email list, <laughs> so you would never get it. Kim, do you have any suggestions how to, can we put it, put the link out on your, on Facebook? I don't, how did everyone find out about this? Library. library? So a lot of you found out from the library, so I'll get the, that to Kim, okay. yeah. and then you could put it out there, because it's got, it's got some neat videos. It's got a video of a warbler feeding up in the black cherry tree. Something you you can't get those by putting birdseed out. They need the native plants that attract the native insects. That's why it was a black pole warbler feeding in the tree. Um, I can't remember. But Is the wren getting you on that? No, list? I do have a video of a wren attacking me. I can send that to you. Would you please send that? It, it, it's always good. Literally, I'll just it tell the story. It is my favorite. This wren, I don't know why it didn't like me, but whenever I would get near its nest box, it would come up and peck me like this. Or it was coming to the back of my neck on a tender skin back there and pecking me back there. And he was just ruthless. He just kept doing it. It was a she or it, I don't know, but it was the most. So I'm trying to make this video of how to observe nestlings and this bird just. <laughs> it's the best video ever. It's you the need best video ever. Give it, yes. <laughs> Send, oh, it's excellent. <laughs> and on that note, I will shut up. <laughs>